Today, we're gonna to talk about Nikon's new 180 to 600 millimeter lens for the Z system. People have been waiting for it. We're gonna talk image quality. Who's it for? Who's it maybe not for? Well, hey everybody, Hudson here. I got my good buddy, workshop coordinator, Rick, with me here. Uh, we are in Moab. He's here to kind of keep me honest and make sure that I, <laughs> sure that I talk about the attributes of this lens that the most, you know, the widest group of people will care about. This is this is the lens all year that that I've been hearing about in the workshops. Is this when's the 180 to 600 coming out? Right. And how good is it going to be? Yeah. And I was skeptical of it. You know, a lot of people have heard me sort of talk about the 200 to 500 and my thoughts on that lens, but it has surprised me. And I think a lot of people are gonna love this lens. I think we're here in Moab right now, getting ready to start our workshop tomorrow here with David Archer. But we've been shooting for the last week in Yellowstone, a lot of wildlife with this lens and also some landscapes. And so, you know, I'm gonna delve in, I'm gonna take you into the studio and analyze some of these images. And we're gonna talk about it compared with the 100 to 400 in particular, because I think that's the, the yeah. great comparison. This is obviously a more affordable lens. The 100 to 400 is a little more potentially versatile on the landscape into things. And if you're going a little lighter with a smaller pack, we'll talk about that and look at some image quality. And then we'll come back and Rick and I are gonna talk about who's this lens for and who's this lens maybe not for. All right, so I'm back here in the studio and images really truly speak quite a bit louder uh, than words alone. So I've got some images here, both from the new 180 to 600 as well as my trusty 100, my trusty 100 to 400. And I'm gonna run through it and just, you know, show you, I, I was skeptical of this lens when it arrived. Uh, and, and right off the bat, I took it out uh, to a spot where my family loves to go kiteboarding on the Columbia River. Uh, Stacy was out kiting, riding her brand new pink hydrofoil, uh, and you know I, I, I took some shots of you know my kids swimming. This is Pepper, Stacy riding her hydrofoil, um, and and then lo and behold, as I'm out shooting, I see this osprey coming towards me uh, with a fish, and you know these are crops. Let me show you the the full frame here. Um, from the Z9. It's quite cropped, so that gives you an idea just how sharp this lens actually is. Uh, pretty darned incredible. Let's go back to the to the loop view here. And, and when I'm in this view, I want everyone to know, you can take a look at my settings up here. I was taking pictures of Stacy kiting and realizing, you know, about a 640th of a second was fast enough. Uh, so, you know, I'm tracking the bird. Luckily, the osprey wasn't moving fast like a little songbird or something. 640th of a second was enough. Like most of my shots were sharp like this, which is just nuts. But you can see all my exposure settings and the focal length and the zoom that I'm at. Um, just, just shocking. Um, you know, I, I was suddenly found myself flipped to bird in flight mode, uh, and this lens handled that pretty darn incredibly. Um, see if this renders the full preview. Yeah, bad day for the fish, great day for the osprey. You know, and my little girl pepper pointing. Wow, wasn't that cool, Dad? Um, I got home, I looked at those images, and I was like, wow, this lens is, is far, far sharper than I would have expected. Um, I was curious, you know, how is it going to handle extreme backlight situations? This is right when we got to Yellowstone the first night, settling into the house. Uh, that we ran the workshop from, and you know, wow, there's a little bit of a sunset going down, a little muddied, not quite a sun star type sunset, but still extreme contrast, a little bit of flare, not much ghosting, pretty, uh, pretty darn incredible. Um, and then afterwards, there was this little echo in the clouds, and you know, I'm looking for chromatic aberration in this high contrast line between pure, oh, near, nearly pure white and black, and. Lens is handling high contrast really, really well. Um, you know, I gotta say, not much aberration to speak of here all the way out at 600, um, at 6.3, not too shabby. Um, we had some elk in the yard right across from us. Mama elk and her baby were both kind of camped out there. And again, I'll show you the crop here. You know, a crop from a Z9, this isn't full frame out at 600, you know, here's the, uh, here's the baby elk. Uh, come on, there it comes. 
Lightroom's acting a little slow on me. I'm not sure what's going on. Oh, I went to full frame. Hold on one sec. Come back. There we go. Nice and sharp. Um, you know, good rendering as the focus falls off. And like image quality from this lens, just surprising. I wondered, you know, one thing I love with my 100 to 400 millimeter lens, we're looking at that right now, is even, you know, back towards 100, it focuses so close uh, that I, I just love using it in macro type situations. I found this little seed pod. I didn't work to like focus stack or do anything like that. I'm just focusing in close, get a feel for it, and then switched lenses while our group was out on the Blacktail Plateau in, in Yellowstone, and I switched out to the 180 to 600. Uh, again, you know, at the at the wider range, at 180, wide open here at f5.6, and wow, um, no complaints about the way that it's rendering the out-of-focus details. I had to back up a little bit, but then I'm at 180 instead of 100, so, you know, pretty, uh, pretty impressive. We had this coyote that showed up while we were up on the, the Blacktail Plateau as well, and I, I just happened to have the 180 to 600 on. This is quite a crop. I just zoomed to full. Let's, let's see what the crop is. Pretty significant crop off the Z9 sensor. Nice and sharp out at 600. Um, you know, it's, it's darned impressive. Um, again, opened up at 6.3 there. So then I slapped the 1.4 teleconverter on the 100 to 400, which, you know, isn't 6.3. It's going to be a little narrower aperture. The, the coyote moved a little bit to a closer background, so I don't get quite that beautiful fall off that I had before. But the 100 to 400 is also quite sharp. There, you know, it may not be quite as sharp as the 180 to 600 with the 1.4 teleconverter on it. To my mind, I think the 100 to 400 just is just as sharp, if not just a little bit more at that 100, well, the 180 to 400 range that's replicated in the 180 to 600. But I would say that from 400 to 600, you're getting a tiny, tiny bit sharper maybe with the 180 to 600 than the 100 to 400 with the 1.4 teleconverter on. But I mean, we're quibbling here, a little bit of sharpening work and post. Both these lenses are just wonderful. Um, you know, here I thought, well, you know, we're looking at the 1.4 teleconverter on the 100 to 400. What's the 1.4 teleconverter like on the 180 to 600? Well, quite good as it happens. You know, here's a buffalo way out there on the horizon. You know, I don't think it's as sharp as it is without the teleconverter, but it handles it just fine. I don't, you know, no lens is as sharp uh, with the teleconverter except for those big exotic. Uh, you know, the, the 400 TC and the 600 TC, um, but not bad at all. You know, you're seeing the full crop there. Um, again, let's, I think this is a significant crop. Yeah. From Z9 image and it's nice. You know, these birds are flying through moving a little faster than my shutter speed, but you can see that the bison's eye is nice and sharp with the 1.4 teleconverter on there. Here are a couple of birds coming in for a landing. Uh, grab some breakfast from grubs and ticks and things, lice. Here's a, here's a pair of somewhat amorous buffalo. The female has her little curly bent horn, super cute. This is with the 1.4 teleconverter. And, you know, certainly acceptably sharp. You know, when I took the 1.4 teleconverter off and cropped a little bit more to get a similar look, I think it's a little bit sharper. Um, but, you know, certainly if we do the back and forth, it's, it's fine to work with the 1.4 teleconverter. They got a little more amorous as, as my photo shoot ended at that point. You know, another little exercise that I thought was cool was taking it out uh, into Lower Yosemite Falls. This is with my 100 to 400. Um, and, you know, here's an image that, that the composition wouldn't quite be possible with the 180 to 600. You'd want to slap your shorter length lens on, whether that's a 70 to 200 or your 24 to 200. Um, but... As you can see, you know, it, it's, it's a fun composition that then I can zoom in. Here's my 240 millimeter composition with the 100 to 400. Uh, image quality is great. I have done almost nothing to any of these images, by the way. A few slider pulls and develop uh, pretty much straight out of camera. Maybe a little contrast work with the black point, white point shadows contrast. So... You know, here's a 400 millimeter frame with the 100 to 400. I, I love that versatility in the landscape with the 100 to 400, you know, coming from, from here or even wider.
to here. When we jump to the 180 to 600, here we are 180, wide open f5.6, uh, and then zoom in, in a bit, still at f5.6 at 270 millimeters, you know, a nice similar composition to the 100 to 400s to go sort of apples to, to apples here. Both look great. Um, zooming in a little tighter here, we're at 600 millimeters. Now that's one you can't do with the 100 to 400. It's interesting. Uh, you know, it, it, you can't get this 180 uh, or you know one below 180 uh, frame of view with the with the 180 to 600. You can't get this 600 millimeter view with the 100 to 400. Uh, well, you can with the 1.4 teleconverter, but you can throw the 1.4 teleconverter on the 180 to 600 and get 840, which is also, I love this one. This is something I would probably have to pull out my 800 millimeter if I had it with me in order to do without the 180 to 600 and the 1.4 teleconverter. For those of you getting the 180 to 600, and I think a lot of you should, this is a sharp, amazing, amazing lens for those who don't have a big prime in your hip pocket um, and who have the space to carry and, and can handle taking the weight of the 180 to 600 around with you, it's a fine landscape lens. And putting that 1.4 teleconverter with it gives you even more flexibility with it both in the landscape and for wildlife. Um, you know, we, we had a, a moon shoot uh, in Moab that uh, we went out to shoot the full moon rising right after sunset in this beautiful location. And I slapped the 180 to 600 on just to test its sharpness in a long lens situation like this. Here, we had two groups, a, a few of us went up on a high point with me just to get a slightly different vantage point. A group stayed back with Rick and David by the cars to photograph. And we were in this beautiful location outside of Moab. We got paragliders out there in the last sunset light. And here I loved having the 600. You know, this, this is awesome. I would have been slapping the 1.4 teleconverter on and not having quite as much reach. But, uh, you know, this is, this is a pretty incredible scene. And, and here's where we knew from doing our research and planning and scouting ahead the moon was going to be rising in this gap between the towers. Uh, nice sharp image out at 280 millimeters with the 180 to 600. I will say I was super frustrated working on the tripod uh, with the lens and I, I switched. I went to 500 ISO. I just found that foot kind of unbearable to work with. You know, if I, if I loosened it enough to turn from vertical to horizontal, it was so loose it rattled and there was a little wind and it was shaking the camera and I'd have to twist it down and lock it and I still didn't feel as secure as I wanted with the foot. I, I hope Kirk comes out with a better foot for the 180 to 600. They will, they're working on it. As soon as it's out, I will link it. Um, I'm sure it will be better. But going handheld at 500 ISO, you know, it, the moon is always at daylight exposure settings. That's why you want to photograph it close to sunset on a full moon uh, so that you can you can get that daylight exposure and get all the detail on the moon and still have some detail in the landscape. And you know, hand holding it 250th of a second, ISO 500, which is your kind of premium low light ISO with great noise reduction. That's the second base ISO in the Z9 and the Z8. Uh, if you've watched my Milky Way course, um, you know, really, really yields a nice image and certainly, certainly sharp. Here's 600 millimeters focused on the moon. Um, again, handheld, you know, that exposure setting doesn't really change. The moon is daylit, so it's 250th of a second at 6.3, ISO. As it got a little darker yet, um, just, just a spectacular evening. It was so fun to do that shoot. And you know that that's that was sort of my last shoot with the 180 to 600. I, I went out and we did some some work where we were carrying packs into the landscape, and I was a little more landscape focused. And having shot a lot with the 180 to 600, I took the 100 to 400 with me. Um, it fits in my pack better. You know, the fact I don't have a 70 to 200, it's kind of that. I have the the, tw the 14 to 24, the 24 120, 100 to 400, and the 1.4 teleconverter is kind of my kit that packs down small and a medium removable camera insert in my bag. Um, and the fact that I can do this work, you know, here I'm at, at 115 millimeters, at 125 photographing Mammoth Hot Springs at dawn, uh, 145, and then 
backing up, I'm on a boardwalk where I couldn't get any farther away. So, you know, capturing portraits of people like John or Tim on the boardwalk at 100, it, it lets me do work that I would normally do with my 70 to 200. Out here in the landscape that evening, photographing buffalo coming and crossing the road across the plain. I felt like this is such a Montana northern part of Yellowstone, Montana, Wyoming, northern part of Yellowstone scene. We're actually in Wyoming here as we're getting close to the Logan Valley. And then being able to pop back and you know, take take some portraits of my workshop crew out there at work, mostly with 100 to 400s, as you can see. Um, and then zoom into 400, boom, I've got the detail I want with the baby calf scratching its chin. Or this hike that we did up to the overlook over Grand Prismatic Springs. You know, I, I took my 100 to 400 in my Leica. That's all I really needed. You know, here's a 100 millimeter landscape scene of the fumaroles boiling up behind this kind of baked tree into the sky. Or, you know, the Grand Prismatic Spring and the people walking around it at 130 millimeters and then zooming into 400 to get details of rain and foggy weather with the Grand Prismatic Spring. Firehole Canyon later that day, this juvenile offspring was waiting for its mom to bring a fish and 400 worked just fine for me. Now, you know, that said, you can tell from my discussion here, I just love my 100 to 400, but... I will say that the image quality out of this 180 to 600, uh, you know, start to finish, just really, really did surprise me. Even with the 1.4 teleconverter uh, installed on it, and its close focusing ability does fantastic. You know, from the very first set of images I went out to capture to the last images I captured with this lens, I have no problem whatsoever recommending it based on image quality. And I think that if Kirk makes a good replacement color foot with a better locking mechanism, that will really help me feel better about people out in the landscape using this lens. All right, so, you know, based just on that image quality analysis, I think everyone can see this is a really sharp lens. It's surprisingly sharp. It's good at its wide end at 180. It's good at its long end at 600. It's nice and sharp wide open. Yeah. It focuses fast. I can tell you that, you know, some of it, some of its physical attributes are, I find it to be a bit front weighted. You know, I'm used to working with some of the new Nikon glass that's like the 800, surprisingly, so back weighted toward the camera that it's, it's easy to handhold. This lens is not hard to handhold, but it gets a little tedious. I, I, yeah, I, I shot a little bit with it, and I could not imagine walking around shooting with that All day for, for, yeah, for extended periods of time. Right. It would be a lot to carry around. Yeah. Now, if I were going somewhere where I knew there was wildlife, like that osprey mm -hmm. stuff that we saw in Yellowstone, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I could see moving around and, and working with it. Right. But I, I kind of felt, after just playing with it, that I'd like a tripod or a monopod for a lot of stuff for that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's not to say it's not handholdable, but it's balanced a little differently than some of the other long S glass that I've been using, where it's it's got more weight out in the front, and so you feel that yeah. that kind of drag while you're carrying it around. It's lighter and smaller, I think, than the old 200 to 500. Just just it feels like it is, uh, and I'm so used to toting the 800 around and shooting with it handheld all day on trips like Costa Rica, you know it. it, it it would be good to have a monopod for this lens if you're shooting a ton with it, I think, wildlife. Yeah. Um, it has a nice hood. I know that the old 200 to 500's hood had a kind of a finicky mechanism. This one's quite nice. It has a push button lock like most of the Z lenses. It's a 95 millimeter filter thread. Uh, I'm thinking about starting to stock some 95 millimeter case kits for people who have this lens and potentially also people who choose to use the 14 to 30 as their wide angle, because that would save on vignetting without going all the way to 112 millimeter. And just to jump in here from the studio for a second, we have stocked the 95 millimeter case filters, both in individual filters and kits. You can click right here, or I'm gonna put a link in the video's description. Um, and they come in the same nice case if you buy the kit as the 112 millimeter filters. I've already got an adapter ring mounted on the 180 to 600 here. You know, the adapter ring still lets you use a pinch cap, which is really nice. And then it's as easy as, you know, pulling out the circular polarizer, click, you can spin it on the magnetic ring. You can pop that off, switch to neutral density. You know, here's a six stop click. You can stack them to your heart's content. Um, 
nice and simple to use. I love the fact, you know, that you can use a pinch cap with the new revolutions because it's, it's just easier to me than using the magnetic cap. You want to take just the cap off, you just pinch it. Um, so, you know, a really great system. I'm going to thread the magnetic ring out with this filter here and say really quickly that if you already have 112 millimeter case filters, it's as simple to use those 112 millimeter filters with this as threading in the 95 to 112 millimeter adapter ring and all of a sudden, boom, you're off to the races with your 112 millimeter filters, which is one of the reasons why I always recommend going a little bigger filter size with magnetic adapter rings than you think you need because the next thing you know, you got a lens that takes bigger filters and your smaller filters won't work with it. You can always adapt to a bigger filter. You can never adapt to a smaller filter. So those are in the store. End of little studio interlude. Um, but it does take 95 millimeter filters. The one thing I just can't stand about this lens, I mean, well, let's, let's focus on the positives. I like, you know, the 100 to 400, which I love so much, it does telescope out and telescope back. Now, that doesn't bother me that much, but a lot of people don't love that. Yeah, um, but, but I will say the 100 to 400, yours, the Nikon, yeah. and my Sony one, they're beautifully balanced lenses. Yeah, they and are. And they're real easy to, to, to handhold all mm -hmm. the way through the range. Mm -hmm. This one felt a little front heavy to me. It is, it's but, a little front heavy. But, you know, I also get 200 more millimeters with this, yeah. you know, and that's something that I think has got people that that's the the thing that people have been latching onto. It's mm -hmm. going to be cheaper, and it's going to it's going to get me to six hundred easily. Yeah. And you know, I, I, well, and there's truth to that. There is truth to yeah. that. There is truth yeah. to that. There's yeah. truth to that. The other thing that I like about it, the good, so the internal internal zoom, you know, doesn't get longer and shorter. I would love if it got shorter for packing into the bag. It's a little big to pack into my bag configuration. You know, I can fit all of my gear into a Naivo medium RCI. I can fit the 100 to 400, the Z9, the 24 to 120, the 14 to 24, and still have room for my 105 millimeter macro in that, in that RCI, or my 112 millimeter filters in the HB97 hood for Nikon. This blows that all up. I gotta use a large RCI, and this completely fills the middle of it. But, you know, if you're, if you're a person who loves to photograph wildlife and you're a bit on a budget, I mean, I think this lens is gonna be your dream lens. It's sharp, it's nice, it really does a great job. If you're using a monopod or a tripod, you're gonna be able to shoot it all day long and get great results out of it. And it's affordable, you know? It has one lens function button instead of two. Not, not a huge deal. It doesn't have a dedicated focus ring. You can program its little programmable ring to be manual focus. I love the, the throw of the zoom ring. It's a real quick, easy turn from 180 to 600, but it's got a nice feel to it. Um, it the thing I can't stand about it, I kind of alluded to this a minute ago, is this, is this foot collar. You know, everybody complains it's not Arca Swiss. Well, it's none of the brands, sadly, yeah. that I know of are going to Arca Swiss feet with their long lenses. You have to go to someone like Kirk who makes beautiful, you know, aftermarket feet with the Arca Swiss, ultra lightweight, really nice. This is one of those that has the removable collar and it clamps in and you lock it in. Now I'll, I'll put a link to this Kirk Arca foot that has two screw points and a, and a, a QD connector so you can click it into your strap, whether, you know, if you're using a QD sling, which is all I like to use. The problem with this guy is, you know, if you, and it has two screws. I know that the old 200 to 500 only have one and it would twist and people hated that. So this has two threaded quarter 20 ports, which is really nice. You can thread it so it locks in place. The problem with it is that when you clamp this guy around the lens and tighten it down, this is a big, as we talked about, front heavy lens. There's a lot of turns to that guy. And to get it loose enough that it even moves, you gotta do a whole bunch of turns. And then when you do, there's, there's play in it. To get it to move smoothly, like you want, you know, for, for gimbling around on a fluid head or a dedicated gimbal head, there's a whole bunch of play in the system. It, and it, when you put it out there, it binds really easily because it's so front heavy. So you really got to loosen it. And there's still some drag. I, I, I wish they'd done something slightly different with this. And then to get it to where you want to carry it around, it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten turns to where it feels. There's still a little 11. You know, that's... And it's not, yeah, it's an annoying, it's an annoying foot. Now that said, you know, you put a, I'm sure that 
there's gonna be some brands like Kirk that come out with a way with QD to sling that really easily, to have it comfortable, and to have it to where it's not as many turns to go from loose to tight. But it's just a, it's just a problem with having this big a front heavy lens with the ring way back here. You know, it might've been better if they'd found a way to put it further forward. Not a deal breaker for those of you on a budget though. I mean, I, I, I picture this lens really fitting in for the person who's on a bit of a budget. They love to shoot wildlife and they've got maybe the 24 to 200 and this is a two lens kit. Maybe the 14 to 30 if you like to do some ultra yeah. wide angles. That's an amazing three lens kit. You go all the way from 14 millimeters to 600. And this lens isn't terrible with the 1.4 teleconverter. You slap that on there, you know, I showed you some images, and suddenly you're at 840. And I think it's higher quality than if you shot it at 600 and cropped in to get the equivalent yeah. as, as 840. It's tough to fit into a kit for me. I'm, I'm not keeping it. Uh, I already have, there have been a number of people expressed interest in buying it. The first was my good buddy Carl, and so this lens is going off to Carl. Um, the, the reason I'm not keeping it is, I love working with the 100 to 400. It's the one I'm gonna throw in my bag all the time. And it, yeah. it eliminates the 70 to 200 for me. You know, it's, it's got that same, that 100 to 200 reach with such sharpness and quality. And I use it a ton in the landscape. It works great for wildlife. If I need more reach, I can throw the 1.4 teleconverter on it. And then if I'm carrying a big lens, you know, I'm fortunate, I'm fortunate enough that I have the 800 PF and that lens is amazing. I've, it's really become an extension of me in wildlife situations where I need reach. And I would much rather be shooting with it than this, you know, and it's not a fair comparison. This lens is 1700 bucks, that lens is $6,000. Um, it's also maybe not even a fair comparison to 100 to 400 in this lens. Although this lens surprisingly gives it a run for money and sharpness. It's just that versatility of reaching all the way back to yeah. 100 and also being so lightweight and small in comparison. You know, it's just a much smaller uh, physical lens. I don't know, what do you- But is it, is, it, is it something that, I mean, if you're going out every once in a while and shooting wildlife, yeah. it feels like, why would I buy this instead of the 100 to 400? I mean, for that 600 millimeters, you know? And, 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 and then you throw the 1.4 teleconverter and you got 840. I, I don't know. I mean, it's the 1700 I think that when it really boils down when it really boils down, this is a really affordable way to have a lens that's great for wildlife. And yes, you have to carry it. You know, you're gonna need a bigger bag. And it, 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 you're still gonna want a lens that reaches through that, that 70 to, to 200 kind of range. You know, this, this starts at 180. So, like I said, the 24 to 200, that's a surprisingly good long, you know, yeah. wide zoom range lens as well. I was blown away when I tested that lens. Mm -hmm. I never thought it would be as good as it is. It's not the 70 to 200. And you know, the 100 to 400, I just, it's super convenient for me. Yeah. So that's my choice, but it's more expensive, you know, and you throw the 1.4 teleconverter in and it's a lot more expensive. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's like twice as much almost. So. I would not hesitate if you have been waiting for this lens and you like to shoot wildlife and the 100 to 400 is a little out of your price range, pff, grab it. You're gonna love it. It's so much higher image quality than the old 200 to 500. I think it's better than all of those super zoom lenses that are out on the market that I've, that I've seen images out of. You know, the Sigma and the Tamron. It, right. This is a great, great lens. It's just heavy. Well, that's the thing. I mean, Nikon and all of the camera companies right now, they're spending more on creating great glass mm -hmm. at all levels. Well, they have to. Yeah, they do have to. They can't have a miss in these the, the, this, this day and age with, you know, not as many people buying cameras. People are using cell phones. So every product needs to be something that people love. It can't be a bad lens these days, especially with Nikon and and Fuji and Canon, I mean, that's it, 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 a shrinking market and each little product needs to come out and exceed expectations and they have been hitting it out of the park in my opinion. Yeah. So that's my, that's my take. I'm not keeping it, but I am shocked at how good it is. All right, so we're, uh, let's see, oh, you know, I don't even know. We'll have a set of office hours upcoming at some point. I'm not sure when this video is gonna yeah. drop in the, I'm in workshop mode right now, but you can always sign up for these big free group photography meetings that we have. 
um, that's you know easy to sign up at hudsonhenry.com slash workshops. You can also click the link up there or go into this video's full description and you'll find links to this lens. If, you, if you're gonna buy this lens, you haven't pre-ordered it yet, using my links definitely helps us out with all the photo education that we do. Um, also, you know, I'll put the link to the Kirk foot, you know, and I, like I said, you guys know me, I love my Luma lab strap. They've become popular enough that there's even a bit of a waiting list to get a yeah. hold of one for yourself. But I love the simplicity of it. I love the comfort of it. You just get that strap lined up, the weight comes down, it's comfortable and you can bring that little slider in and get it just right where you want on your hip. But the second that you want to be shooting, whoop, you're up and rolling, you know, that's, it's a great way to carry a long lens or just your camera in general. So I'll put links to that stuff. It's just a really nice way to sling this thing. Um, again, you know, I hope everybody's out there staying creative, staying safe, and we'll see you next week.